Some student comments posted online thought it was a terrible idea of bringing you on campus because they thought having a conversation with you about ethics was akin to bringing Tiger Woods here to talk about fidelity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll take a moment. I'll take a moment to correct that notion. Um, as I see it, this evening is meant to be a learning experience for the students. Uh, to show an example of what happens when citizens take their hands off the real democracy and allow the people that we elect to hijack that democracy to their own ends. Our preamble states we the people, not we the politicians. Citizens confer legitimacy upon government, not elected officials, and only when all citizens vote and are engaged in democracy can we retain control of the various governments that we, the people, have created. We really do get the government we deserve. Unfortunately, at times, it's not always government we want. Obviously, you are innocent until proven guilty uh, in, a, in a court of law. Um, so what I would like to get a sense of, innocent or guilty, is a question that I pose to each of my students. And that is, what's your definition of political corruption? Well, that's a good question. I think the strict interpretation and the strict definition would be doing anything that's against the law and illegal. There is a broader term, though, from an ethical and moral standpoint, and that's what I call the corruption defense. And while this may occasionally not be strictly illegal, some of the things that Mike Madigan, John Cullerton, and even Pat Quinn, my successor of the today's government, are not strictly illegal. The people are paying higher taxes and not getting as good as government because some of these acts are ethically bankrupt and ethically corrupt. And the reason it's illegal, for example, for Mike Madigan to uh, operate, John Cullerton to operate as lawyers representing clients where their public duties collide with their private interests is because these are the guys who make the rules. And so when they make the rules, you know, they make it so that they can legally uh, have clients who have that kinds of, those kinds of conflicts. But I believe that is a form of corruption. Not illegal, strictly, but ethically and morally corrupt and morally bankrupt. And it was those sorts of things in that system that I fought. And again, what's so ironic about this, Professor, is that this whole story is upside down. And when I'm vindicated in court, you'll not only see that that system was corrupt, but these allegations and some of the dynamics behind that will, will be also, uh, I think, subject to review the ethics and the propriety of, of some of the behavior that, that's been leveled in this particular case. You know, it's, it's interesting what you're, what you're saying in terms of the legalities of it, because a common thread uh, my students' uh, responses are uh, to act in one's personal interest uh, at the expense of the public interest. What we talk about is that corruption comes in many flavors, uh, but it's also at times legal, uh, which is sort of like perfecting the art of operating within the boundaries, just inside the boundaries of the law. My second question uh, is in regard to that, because this goes back to 2002, just before you ran for the first time. Uh, and the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform at that time had uncovered roughly $650,000 in donations from uh, just four construction companies, all of them controlled by a close friend of yours, um, Chris Kelly. Cindy Canary, who is the executive director of ICPR, said it demonstrated a pattern of multiple, large, and coordinated contributions from companies doing business with the state. And she wondered why a candidate, that would be you, was promising to root out political corruption raised such huge sums of money from those who did business with the state. So given your previous response about dancing just inside the law, is this the kind of behavior we should expect from a reform candidate? Do you really need a law to tell you that maybe, just maybe, this wasn't quite a full um, That's a great question. And there's, a, there's an ethical issue here, obviously a legal issue, and there's a larger moral issue. This is a very important point. Um, and let, and let me start out, Professor, you'll agree that that allegation is legal. It is legal to raise money from contractors under state law. And it was until um, somewhere around the fall of 2008. And then it was banned for the governor, but it was allowed for the, for the uh, legislative leaders, the lawmakers, and other elected officials. I have mentorly vetoed that to include all of them, including me. So I was prepared to change the law. Having said that, that's the law and those are the rules. And it's a very competitive business in politics. When President Obama, for example, makes Lou Sussman, the 
the, uh, the ambassador, Dakota State, St. James, and we sucked him with a big contributor to Obama, raising $500,000, and, and he raised me money, and the president makes this guy the ambassador, that's within the rules and the law. Now, when you're fighting in a trend system with cynical politicians like Mike Madigan and cynical politicians like Cullerton, who like it the way it is, and these guys have been there. Governors come and go, but these lawmakers stay. And if you're committed to keep your promises to the people, to push and prod and fight that system by changing where all the money goes. Now remember, this is a fight over money. And you're talking about billions of dollars. And when you're starting to move money around, the people who like it the way it was, who are represented by lobbyists and special interests, they don't want you to touch their money. What they want you to do, and there's almost consensus in Springfield, certainly among the Democrats, my party, to raise taxes on people. They want more of the people's money. And you're determined to keep your promise not to do that, but at the same time, Professor, you feel you have a moral obligation to simply not stand pat, but move forward. So you want health care for every child, which we got. You want to give preschool to three and four-year-olds, which we expanded. You want to put a record amount of money into public education. I went to public schools, but you don't want to do it on the backs of taxpayers. You got to figure out, you have the law that requires constitutional law, requires balancing the budgets. Now you're going to be in there, and you got, your decision is, you want to play ball with them and just do what they tell you to do, which is basically raise taxes on people, or are you going to fight the special interest that they're protecting? So we took on the trucking industry, and we raised fees on them to pay for some of this because the fees there in the trucking industry were lower than comparative states. Closed corporate tax loopholes. I found 700 checking accounts in Illinois government that today still exist with $3 billion in surplus, but they're protected by special interest groups. We took those on and found the money. For six years, I didn't raise taxes on people, but I put a record amount of money in education, gave more people health care in Illinois than any governor in the history of the United States of America, but protected taxpayers. And what gave me the ability morally to fight that fight, Professor, was that you take the political heads, they criticize you for fundraising, but as long as you do it legally, then you're positioned to fight these people and not take your marching orders from Mike Madigan or Mayor Daley or the political powers in Illinois that have been calling the shots here for the past generation. There's a second, those of you who are history students, especially those who studied the classics, may remember Thucydides, who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War. And this is a lesson that I never forgot, and I apply it to politics. It's about power. Power is in question only among equals. The weak will do the bidding of the strong, while the strong will forever exact their wills. I knew what they were going to try to make me do to the people, and I wouldn't do it. And I wasn't going to settle for simply staying put. I wanted to move forward. So I raised money, and raised a lot of money legally, legally, to be in a position to be able to be independent and fight them. And we have health care for all of our kids, because part of the political deal was I had to offend some of my biggest fundraising supporters of the Trial Lawyers Association, because that was a deal with Madigan and Emil Jones that if we passed caps on damages, I, they would pass my all kids health care plan and give every child access to health care. So you're asking me morally, when you're doing real good things for families and helping a small child be able to see a doctor, and you're following the law on fundraising, is that the moral thing you're done right? And these people who talk about ethics, but don't do anything for people, we should call them in here, Professor, and ask them about their ethics and their morality.